Malaz, I have only one small request. What do you propose to do about the principal? Whatever your lordship says, we'll do, Malaz. Well, whatever your lordship says, we will do. There is no issue. SIT is constituted. SIT is constituted. But whatever your lordship will say, we will do. We are not. Well, this is not adversarial, as I said. Well, just give me just one minute. I just handed over something to your lordship. Just have a look at it. Just give it to my lord. Three copies that I hand. All right, Mr. Sibel, we'll just hear the solicitor for a minute. He just wants a minute. All right. Lord, I, I just, Lord, uh, I want this, Lord. Your Lordship, Lord, may I just submit? In charge, the OG, who wait. is already a tainted officer no. in a, an affidavit filed before this court, should be replaced by any other in charge DG of their choice. Well, I just have this. Uh, another, we another have one. Set, uh, just, we have set out what is in the media and we have set out the reality. No, share it with For all it, of us. We will share it, don't worry. No, no, no. Calcutta police inform the family member that the no, present case no, no, was of suicide. Scenario. False. No, another, another, False. Aspect. Another aspect. At no, no time did the police get this information. Yeah. What we propose to do is we'll indicate what the broad parameters of our uh, intervention in this matter uh, consists of. We'll just pronounce it very shortly. For one thing, Mr. Sibyl, we are very, very concerned. Let not the power of the state of West Bengal be unleashed on peaceful protesters. Yes. Yes. I, I give to your, I give, to, we have videos, we have videos of all that happened. People who are people, whether they are doctors, civil society, lawyers, people who are protesting, so long as there is no act of destruction of... We have videos. We agree. Let there not be the power of the state unleashed Agree. peaceful protection. Well, as I agree, Should and that has not no, happened. No. One second. We have videos which we have placed which we place before your lordship. And well, as what happens is political parties get into the act and this is what happens. People, people who are taken to the media to communicate their views, yes. let us deal with them with a great deal of... I agree, I agree. It's a time, it's a time of national catharsis. Yes. Look at the girl. Don't in denial. Because now, for example, they say... Whip. Pelvic and collarbone was broken. False. Post-mortem doesn't say that. Not just going to state in the center, then so the CBI, Fair. CBI is investigating it. Yes. We will ask for a report from the CBI. Now, what we what we propose to do is one second. Just one second. This must stop. We are here. We are in charge of the proceeding. We have heard Mr. Solicitor. We have heard Mr. Sibyl. If we start hearing all the interveners, there'll be no end to it. Please have some patience. We are going to now tell you what we are proposing to do. We are not disposing of the case, but let's allow us to at least pronounce what we intend to do. All right. Well, this is the uh, list of acts. Would you not sit just so on, a minute, on, on, on 9 August 2024, a 31 year old postgraduate doctor at RG Carr Medical College Hospital, Kolkata, who was in a 36 hour duty shift, was raped and murdered inside the seminar room of the hospital. As horrific details have emerged in the course of media reportage, the brutality of the sexual assault and the nature of the crime have shocked the conscience of the nation. The name and graphic images of the deceased have been widely circulated on social media without regard to her privacy or dignity. Writ petitions were instituted before the Calcutta High Court seeking, among other things, a court-monitored investigation of the crime and the conduct of the hospital authorities, including the role of the principal of the medical colleges, college, and other officials by a special team of investigating officers. It has been alleged that the parents of the deceased were initially informed that their daughter had committed suicide. They were permitted to see the dead body after several hours, and a first information report in regard to the murder was registered belatedly by the police after several hours. By its order dated 13 August 2024, the High Court transferred the investigation to the Central Bureau of Investigation. Following the incident, agitations and protests were called by doctors' associations, student bodies, and civic groups across the country. On the eve of Independence Day, several areas in Kolkata saw protests spurred by the Reclaim the Night campaign. At 12.30 a.m. on 15 August, when a protest was underway at the hospital, a large mob assembled at the premises of the RG Carr Medical College Hospital and vandalized the emergency ward and other departments of the hospital. Following the acts of wanton disruption and vandalism, the Indian Medical Association, a private and voluntary organization of doctors in India, 
called for a nationwide withdrawal of medical services except med emergency services for 24 hours on 17 August 2024. In the aftermath of the brutal incident and the demonstrations which followed, the state government was expected to ensure the deployment of the state machinery to prevent a breach of law and order. It was all the more necessary to do so since investigation of the crime which took place in the precincts of the hospital was underway. We are unable to comprehend how the state was not prepared to deal with the incident of vandalization of the premises of the hospital. Nationwide protests following the brutal incident in Arjikar Medical College Hospital have brought the issue of the lack of institutional safety for doctors to the forefront. Medical associations have consistently raised issues of the lack of workplace safety in healthcare institutions. Medical professionals in the performance of their duties have been unfortunate targets of various forms of violence. Hospitals and medical care facilities are open throughout the day and night. Medical professionals, doctors, nurses, and paramedic staff work round the clock. Unrestricted access to every part of healthcare institutions has made healthcare professionals susceptible to violence. Patients of relatives in anguish are quick to attribute untoward results to the negligence of medical professionals. Such allegations are immediately followed by violence against medical professionals. In May 2024, Two on-duty doctors were allegedly attacked by relatives of a patient who died during treatment in a hospital in West Bengal. In another incident in May 2024 in Bihar, following the death of a 25-year-old pregnant patient, a nurse was allegedly pushed off the first floor of the building by the kin of the patient. In August 2024, a final year resident in a hospital in Hyderabad was allegedly assaulted by a patient's attendants after the patient died due to medical condition. These incidents of violence are a few among the many that have been unleashed against members of the medical community in the recent past. They are portents of a systemic failure to protect doctors, nurses, and paramedical staff in the confines of hospitals. With few or no protective systems to ensure their safety, medical professionals have become vulnerable to violence. With the involvement of systemic issues for healthcare across the nation, this court has had to intervene. Women are at particular risk of sexual and non-sexual violence in these settings. Due to ingrained patriarchal attitudes and biases, relatives of patients are more likely to challenge women medical professionals. In addition to this, female medical professionals also face different forms of sexual violence at the workplace by colleagues, seniors, and persons in authority. Sexual violence has had its origins even within the institution, the case of Aruna Shanbag being a case in point. There is a hierarchy within medical colleges and the career advancement and academic degrees of young professionals are capable of being affected by those in the upper echelons. The lack of institutional safety norms at medical establishments against both violence and sexual violence against medical professionals is a matter of serious concern. While gendered violence is the source of more malevolent manifestations of the structural deficiencies in public health institutions, the lack of safety is of concern to all medical professionals. Preserving safe conditions of work is central to realizing equality of opportunity to every working professional. This is not, a just, this is not just a matter of protecting doctors. Their safety and well-being as health providers is a matter of national interest. As more and more women join the workforce in cutting-edge areas of knowledge and science, the nation has a vital stake in ensuring safe and dignified conditions of work. The constitutional value of equality demands nothing else and will not brook compromises on the health, well-being, and safety of those who provide health care to others. The nation cannot await another rape or murder for real changes on the ground. Several states, such as Maharashtra, Kerala, Karnataka, Telangana, West Bengal, Andhra Pradesh, and Tamil Nadu, have enacted legislation to protect healthcare service professionals from violence and damage to property. All these enactments prohibit any act of violence against medical professionals. The offense is non-bailable and punishable with three years of imprisonment. However, these enactments do not address the institutional and systemic causes that underlie the problem. An enhanced punishment without improving institutional safety standards falls short of addressing the problem effectively. We have attempted to flag here the ground reality indicating the lack of institutional safety standards in healthcare institutions. 
A non-exhaustive formulation is set out below. A. Medical professionals who are posted for night duties are not provided adequate resting spaces. More often, doctors rest in the patient's room or in available public spaces. Duty rooms are scanned. Separate duty rooms for male and female medical professionals are conspicuous by their absence in most healthcare establishments. B. Interns, residents, and senior residents are made to perform 36 hour shifts and conditions where even basic needs of sanitation, nutrition, hygiene, and rest are lacking. There is an absence of uniformity in terms of a standard national protocol. The fear of retribution prevents most healthcare professionals from questioning the absence of facilities for basic well being. C. Lack of security personnel in medical care units is more of a norm than an exception. More often than not, medical professionals, which includes young resident doctors, interns, and nurses, are left to handle unruly attenders. Open access to healthcare facilities leaves medical professionals vulnerable to undesirable elements. D. Medical care facilities do not have sufficient toilet facilities. Most often, there is only one common toilet for medical professionals in one department. E. The hostels or places of stay for medical professionals are situated far from the hospital. Doctors and nurses who have to travel to and from the hospital are not provided transport facilities by the institution. Even within the precincts of the sprawling spaces of public hospitals, there is either inadequate or no transportation facilities for the safe commute of professionals. F. There is an absence or lack of properly functioning CCTV cameras to monitor ingress and egress to the hospital and to control access to sensitive areas. G. The patients and their attenders have unrestricted access to all places within the hospital, including intensive care units and the doctor's resting rooms. H. Lack of screening for arms and weapons at the entrance of hospitals. I. Dingy and ill-lit places within the hospitals. J. Medical professionals have to shoulder the responsibility of being both medical and emotional caregivers to patients and their relatives. There are no supportive facilities and no training and communication skills. And K. Certain spaces within hospitals, such as the intensive care unit and the emergency wards, are prone to a greater risk of violence because of the severity of medical conditions of patients in these departments. We have in this backdrop formed the view that a national consensus must be evolved after due consultation with all stakeholders on the urgent need to formulate protocols governing the issues which this order has highlighted. We have attempted to compose for this purpose a diverse body of persons with experience in healthcare institutions. A national task force with the following members of the medical profession is hence constituted. 1. Surgeon Vice Admiral Aarti Sarian, AVSM, VSM, Director General Medical Services, Navy. 2. Dr. D. Nageshwar Reddy, Chairman and Managing Director, Asian Institute of Gastroenterology and AIG Hospitals, Hyderabad. 3. Dr. M. Srinivas, Director, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Ames, Delhi. 4. Dr. Pratima Murthy, Director, National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Nimhans, Bangalore. E. Dr. Govardhan Dattpuri, Executive Director, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Jodhpur. 5. Dr. Uh, sorry, 6. Dr. Somitra Rawat, Chairperson, Institute of Surgical Gastroenterology, GI and HPB Oncosurgery and Liver Transplantation, and Member Board of Management, Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi, and Member Court of Examiners of the Royal College of Surgeons, England. 8. Professor Anita Saxena, Vice Chancellor, Pandit B.D. Sharma Medical University, Rohtak, formerly Dean of Academics, Chief Cardiothoracic Center and Head Cardiology Department at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences, Delhi. 9. Dr. Pallavi Saple, Dean Grant Medical College and Sir JJ Group of Hospitals, Mumbai. And 10. Dr. Padma Srivastav, former professor at the Department of Neurology, Ames, Delhi, currently serving as the chairperson of neurology at Paris Health Gurugram. The following shall be the ex officio members of the NTF A. The Cabinet Secretary to the Government of India. B. The Home Secretary to the Government of India. C. 
the Secretary, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India, D, Chairperson of the National Medical Commission, and E, President of the National Board of Examiners. Examinations, sorry. The NTF shall formulate effective recommendations to remedy the issues of concern pertaining to safety, working conditions, and well-being of medical professionals and other cognate matters highlighted in the above segments of this order. The NTF shall, while doing so, consider the following aspects to prepare an action plan. The action plan may be categorized under two heads. One, preventing violence, including gender-based violence against medical professionals, and two, providing an enforceable national protocol for dignified and safe working conditions for interns, residents, senior residents, doctors, nurses, and all medical professionals. One, prevention of violence against medical professionals and providing safe working conditions. A, ensuring due security in medical establishments. One, triaging departments and places within the hospital based on the degree of volatility and the possibility of violence. Areas such as emergency rooms and intensive care units are prone to a greater degree of violence and may possibly need additional security in place to deal with any untoward incident. Two, a baggage and person screening system at every entrance of the hospital to ensure that arms are not carried inside the medical establishment. Three, preventing intoxicated persons from entering the premises of the medical establishment unless they are patients. And four, Training security personnel employed at hospitals to manage crowds and grieving persons. B. Infrastructural development. 1. Provision of separate resting rooms and duty rooms in each department for A. Male doctors, B. Female doctors, C. Male nurses, D. Female nurses, and E. A gender-neutral common resting space. The room must be well ventilated, have sufficient bed spaces, and provide a facility for drinking water. Access to these rooms must be restricted through installation of security devices. Two, adopting appropriate technological intervention to regulate access to critical and sensitive areas, including through the use of biometric and facial recognition. Three, ensuring adequate lighting at all places in the hospital. And if it is a place, if it is a hospital attached to a medical college, all places within the campus. Four, installation of CCTV cameras at all entrance and exit points of the hospitals and the corridors leading up to all patient rooms. And five, if the hostels or rooms of the medical professionals are away from the hospital, provision of transport between 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. for those who wish to travel to or from their place of stay to the hospital. C, employment of social worker, workers trained in grief and crisis counseling at all medical establishments. D, conducting workshops for all employees of medical establishments, including doctors, nurses, and helpers on handling grief and crisis. E, Constitution of Employee Safety Committees, composed of doctors, interns, residents, and nurses at every medical establishment to conduct quarterly audits on institutional safety measures. F, including additional requirements on institutional safety measures for medical professionals as a criteria for accreditation of healthcare establishments by the National Accreditation Board for Hospitals and Healthcare Providers. And G, the possibility of establishing police posts in medical facilities commensurate with the footfall bed strength and facilities. Two, prevention of sexual violence against medical professionals. A, the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Prevention, Prohibition and Redress Act 2013 applies to hospitals and nursing homes, including private health care providers. In terms of the provisions of the Act, an Internal Complaints Committee must be constituted in all hospitals and nursing homes. B, the duties of an employer listed under Section 19 of the Sexual Harassment of Women at Workplace Act 2013 which includes organizing sensitization programs and providing a safe working space must be discharged. And C, ensuring for every medical institution a helpline number for medical professionals, which is open 24-7 and emergency distress facilities. It is clarified that the phrase medical professionals used in this judgment encompasses every medical professional, including doctors, medical students who are undergoing the compulsory rotating medical internship as a part of the MBBS court, resident doctors and senior resident doctors and nurses, including those who are nursing interns. The phrases medical establishments, hospital, medical institutions are interchangeably used. The NTF shall be at liberty to make recommendation on all aspects of the action plan highlighted above and any other aspects which, are, which the members seek to cover. They are at liberty to make additional suggestions where appropriate. The NTF shall also suggest appropriate timelines by which the recommendations could be implemented 
based on the existing facilities and hospitals. The NTF is required to consult all stakeholders. Bearing in mind the gravity and urgency of the situation, we have included the heads of the National Medical Commission and the National Board of Examinations as ex officio members of the NTF. Bearing in mind the national concerns which have been raised over the issue and the high priority which must be given to the creation of safe working conditions in healthcare institutions, we request the Cabinet Secretary to the Union Government to associate with the work of the NTF. The Home Secretary of the Union Government has also been made a member of the NTF in order to facilitate proper coordination with the state governments. The Secretary to the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare of the Government of India will be the member secretary of the NTF. The Ministry of Health and Family Welfare will provide all logistical support, including making arrangements for travel, stay, and secretarial assistance, and bear the expenses of the members of the NTF. The NTF is required to submit, is requested to submit an interim report within three weeks and the final report within two months from the date of this order. All state governments and union territory governments through their secretaries in the ministries of health and family welfare and the central government through the secretary union ministry of health and family welfare must collate information from all hospitals run by the state and by the central government respectively on the following aspects. A. How many security personnel are employed at each hospital and each department? B whether there is a baggage and person screening mechanism in place at the entrance of the medical establishment. C, the total number of resting stroke duty rooms in the hospital and specific details of the number in each department. D, the facilities provided in the resting stroke duty rooms. E, information on whether all areas of the hospital are accessible to the general public and if so, with or without any security restrictions. F, whether there are CCTV cameras in the hospital, if there are, how many and in which locations. G, whether the institution provides medical professionals training to appropriately handle the grief of patients. If so, the details of the training must be provided. H, whether social workers who specialize in handling grief of families of the patients are employed at the hospital. If so, then total number of social workers must be provided. I, whether there are police outposts within the premises of the hospital or the medical college hospital campus. J, whether an internal complaints committee in terms of the sexual harassment of women at Workplace Act 2013 has been constituted and K, whether the employer of the establishment has discharged the duties prescribed by Section 19 of the Act of 2013, if so, the details of it. The data submitted shall be tabulated and filed with an affidavit by the Union Government within one month from this order. The Central Bureau of Investigation shall submit a status report to this court by, we'll say 22nd, no, not 23rd, by 22, 22. By 22nd August 2024, on the progress in the investigation of the crime at RG Carr Medical College Hospital, the state of West Bengal shall also file a status report by 23, 22 August 2024 on the progress of the investigation on the acts of vandalism which took place at the hospital in the aftermath of the incident. The matter will now be listed on 23 on 22 August. 2020. Not only one request. What is shared by the state of West Bengal with your lordships be given to CBI. We also need, uh, like, you know, to have it. You know, they cannot have any objection. One second, I can just say, you know, when that is.